The following special is made possible in part by contributions from all the great people who are members of WQED. Oh, yeah, memories of coming here. I mean, I remember begging my mom for cotton candy, begging not to go home. I remember riding the Little Dipper and the Roundup. I remember rides that have been taken out, riding the ponies. A lot of things in Kennywood stayed the same for a long time. The boats in the lake. The uh, Buck Rogers-like um, airplanes that flew out over the boats in the lake and that terrific merry-go-round. Every summer since 1899, people around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania have been going to an amusement park called Kennywood. Kennywood has been a place for picnics, for music, for all sorts of rides, and especially for several of the world's greatest old wooden roller coasters. Over the years, Kennywood has seen lots of good times. Sitting high on a bluff above the Monongahela River, it's outlasted most of the heavy industry that originally brought fame and fortune to the valley. Kennywood's charms and thrills have made it an important part of the Pittsburgh summer. When you go to Kennywood, you can't see it all. You never know what goes on behind the rides. And while you're trying to taste all the kinds of Kennywood cuisine, you don't stop to think about all the history that's made this place such an extraordinary Pittsburgh institution. And maybe you've never been there on Italian Day. It doesn't matter. If you've ever been to Kennywood, you know that the best things you take with you when your parents force you to leave at the end of the night are memories. On summer mornings, Kennywood doesn't open to the public until 11 o'clock. But the people who take care of the park are there at sunrise. The park in the morning is an oddly serene place. No screams or squeals or oompa music. The crews inspect every ride every day. Fred Weber is the head of the maintenance crews. He started to work at Kennywood when he was in high school. Now he's in charge of the dozen or so men who maintain the rides. It's hard to keep up in the old ride because, you know, there's not parts available. Sometimes you have to have them remanufactured. The new rides are a little bit more complicated. You know, the old rides, you push a button and they turn and go and go and go. But the new rides, they sort of they get into the computers and uh, it's sort of another field. Fred remembers coming to Kennywood when he was a kid. When you're younger, you mostly remember Kitty Land. You like the old Swan ride and the, the, old, the old seaplane ride we used to have and the sailboat ride, which we don't have anymore. One ride that lures people to the park is the roller coaster called the Thunderbolt. Most experts consider it one of the greatest coasters in the world. Two men start every morning with a walk along the entire length of the Thunderbolt's path. They inspect the track, looking for potential problems. They tap in loose spikes, making all necessary adjustments and repairs. Usually, Gino Chambordon will walk one way around the track, while Brian Bartley goes the other way. They've been working together for a couple years on the Thunderbolt. Usually, we don't have to tell each other what to do. We just know what to do. The catwalks on a roller coaster are most dangerous on a morning like this, just after a rain. The wet, greasy wood can be like ice. You all right, Gino? Yeah. Sure you all right? Yeah. Once the track has been checked out, Brian and Gino will work on the coaster's chain. 
Then they'll usually give the empty train a dry run. If all seems okay, Gino will then get ready to oil the track. He hangs out the front of the train. You dropped the lock bar, so this is locked. I'll just get in here and put my knee against the pad and brace myself. Gino has to make this run twice, once for each side of the track. Growing up as a kid, I was afraid of coasters, especially the jackrabbit. My first job was working on the jackrabbit. I ended up being a manager for three years. Meanwhile, there's a lot of other early morning business going on in the park. Kennywood has always taken pride in its beautiful gardens and fancy floral displays. Near the entrance to Kittyland, there's a huge calendar made from flowers, and the date changes every morning. Over at the Tilt-A-Whirl, Charlie Lyons finishes up and then heads for the Grand Prix, the bumper car ride that's housed now in a building next to the highway. When I first started here, there was a lot of older buildings in the park. We had some older rides, and now things are sort of changing. It still has its character, but it's a little different now. It's not the old stuff anymore. It's a little newer, and you sort of have to adjust yourself to it, you know. It's like a little faster-paced world out here now. But it's almost like Kennywood's here regardless of the public coming in and out, different generations, and the different management that comes and goes or whatever. Kennywood's here, and it's probably always going to be here. You know, it's just something that exists. Kennywood hasn't always existed. In the early 19th century, this tract of land, 10 miles up the Monongahela River from downtown Pittsburgh, belonged to the Kenny family. They mined coal on the property, but it was most famous for its beautiful groves of oak and maple trees. Families started coming here for picnics about the time of the Civil War. People called it Kenny's Grove. In 1898, the Monongahela Street Railway Company leased the grove and the surrounding property from the Kenny family in order to start what was called a trolley park. There were many competing streetcar companies in Pittsburgh around the turn of the century, and there were then 13 trolley or railroad parks in the Pittsburgh area. Andrew Mellon had a large interest in the Monongahela Street Railway Company, and he's usually credited with naming the park Kennywood. At first, there was a cafeteria although most families still brought picnics. There was a dance pavilion, a merry-go-round, and a small bandstand for music. The music you're hearing right now was composed by a 16-year-old girl who visited the park in 1899. That's her daughter, Isabel Snyder, in the blue sweater. When Isabel's mother came to the park that first season, she posed for a photo on a small bridge in front of what is now this green and yellow refreshment stand. At the time, it was the merry-go-round building. Isabel's mother's name was Margaretha Scandroli. She titled this piece, The Kennywood Park Waltz. When we were little, we would all be put to bed at night, and, and we'd call down, and my mother would play music for us. On, and she's played this piece many, many a time, I've heard it. By 1900, the park had added a glorious new band shell and an athletic field. Kennywood called itself Greater Pittsburgh's most popular out-of-town resort. Starting in 1902, Kennywood had roller coasters. Primitive and somewhat gentle, they were sometimes called toboggans. People apparently loved them, and the park assured its patrons, each device receives regular systematic inspection, ensuring absolute safety at all times. Safety is still a constant concern, that's why they insist on this rigorous maintenance. Good. Over the years, there have been some tragic accidents. A few people have died at Kennywood, often having disregarded safety warnings. One of the most remembered accidents occurred in 1968, when a rider was thrown from the brand new Thunderbolt. Some say that the yeah. death-defying thrills nice are what the park is all about. But Kennywood doesn't take any chances. Having finished their work on the Thunderbolt, Brian Bartley and Gino Chambordon have come here to make sure all is safe on the park's 1980 steel coaster, the Laser Loop. 
Before anyone else gets on this ride, Brian and Gino make sure it's safe and personally test it. While maintenance men will work at Kennywood year-round, most of the park employees are here just for the summer. A lot of high school and college kids operate the rides and take care of other park business. They constitute a sort of Kennywood subculture. What's tomorrow? I work till close. Hey. Do you work till uh, I'm off. Beth Snodgrass is one of the regulars on the ride called the Wave Swinger. She's from Dravosburg and goes to school at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. When she gets here first, she has to take care of the morning procedure. It's depending on uh, who I talk to, <laughs> how long I dowdle around before I go get the ticket can. Usually try to turn the ride on about quarter to 12. And then it heats up. And if someone else comes in, somebody gets to ride it. If you're, if you're early enough. And if it's my manager, Chris, then we get coffee <laughs> and cookies. The swings are clean. They are clean. Chris Snyder is the manager of the Wave Swinger. That means he's responsible for some of the scheduling and record keeping. With two employees there, one can personally test the ride. It's a good summer job if you go to college. We make minimum wage, but we work 10 hours a day. So during the busy season, you make a lot of money. It was a lot for me. <laughs> As it gets closer to noon, School picnic buses arrive, and the parking lot starts to fill. The park has always been proud of its ample space for parking. Kennywood kept growing. The trolley park became Pittsburgh's most popular amusement park. In 1906, a group of businessmen called Kennywood Park Limited took over the lease. Descendants of two of these men, Andrew McSwiggan and Frederick Henninger, have owned and operated the park ever since. It's a family business, a dual dynasty, that's seen Kennywood through good and bad times. The old Kenny family still owned the property until 1971, when the Kennywood Park Corporation finally bought the land. Things start going full tilt at noon, when you first hear the mighty voice of Kennywood. Good morning, Kennywood. The park has old-fashioned grace and style, and old rides. Most Kennywood connoisseurs consider the Jackrabbit roller coaster as the oldest surviving ride in the park. Designed by John A. Miller of the Miller & Baker Company, it opened in the 1921 summer season. Generations of Pittsburghers have taught their children the secrets of this ride. See how the back seat pops up? This coaster cost $50,000 to build in 1921. It took advantage of the natural topography of Kennywood, plunging into the ravine behind the Penny Arcade. It originally had a tunnel over the curve at the top of the first hill, but that was removed in the 1940s. The Jackrabbit's probably most famous for its unique, surprising, and deep double dip. Sections of the coasters are replaced every winter, so most of the wood on the Jackrabbit is probably less than 10 years old. But riders still seem to appreciate the thrills that an old wooden coaster gives you that a steel coaster can't imitate. If you want to know about the history of the park and its rides, the best person to talk to is Charles J. Jackways, Jr. He's the author of a history book titled Kennywood, Roller Coaster Capital of the World. He can point out some of the finer points of a ride like the turtle. If you see what a big ride it is with all those big old springs, those are big from the 1930s. When you ride, they ride kind of like a big old uh, Mack truck. Originally called the Tumble Bug when it premiered at Kennywood in 1927, this ride was built in nearby Beaver Falls by the Travers Engineering Company. 
Its tumblebud used to be a standard at amusement parks across the country. There are only a few left. Gosh, it's over 50 years old, but it's still exciting. Watching the faces of those little kids in there where they're sort of, ah, pushed around, mother, you're gonna sit on me. That's the fun of the ride. When he's not at Kennywood having a good time, or doing research, Charles Jackways is an attorney in Natrona Heights. He is also president of the National Carousel Association. In the stairway and basement of his office building, he's gathered perhaps the world's greatest collection of souvenirs and information on amusement parks. Jackways has many notebooks devoted to Kennywood. I am attempting to corner the market of three ring notebooks. Charlie also wrote a book on Pittsburgh's other major amusement park, Westview, which closed in 1977. In 1979, he also began the Amusement Park Journal. He's a world-class authority on amusement parks. So when it comes to rides like the turtle, Charles J. Jackways Jr. is one of America's great historians and an expert on the traditions of riding. Ah, oh, you always say ah oh, at the end of the ride. There's another turtle ride in the park, a miniature version over in Kitty Land, where there are lots of scaled down rides for little kids. In the early 1900s, Kennywood set up a free playground for children. In 1924, the park established its first Kitty Land over near the Jackrabbit. The little rides were moved to what is still Kitty Land today in 1927. The new Kitty Land featured this brownie roller coaster, and in 1931, Kennywood purchased the first Kitty Tickler, a ride that's sometimes called a Virginia Reel. After World War II, when America experienced the great baby boom, Kennywood was ready with one of the biggest kitty lands in the country. Little kids seem to like the special size of the rides, and you don't have to go to school to know which ones you like and which ones you don't. Sometimes you just want to ride the same ride over and over again. And sometimes it's hard to control your enthusiasm. Most people call Harry Henninger, Henny. He's a grandson of F.W. Henninger, who, along with A.S. McSwiggin, took control of the park back in 1906. Today, Henny Henninger is vice president and general manager of Kennywood, but he's worked all over the park. I worked in Kitty Land as a ride operator. The two through six-year-olds are really part of the most fun of working at Kennywood and seeing their face their joy the first time on the Cadillacs or the boats makes it all worthwhile. These tiny Cadillacs with two steering wheels have been running on the little turnpike track since 1955. This is where a lot of Pittsburghers got their first experience at driving. When you get old enough and tall enough to ride bigger rides, one of the transitional steps between Kitty Land and Grown Up Kennywood is always the auto ride. While the Kitty Land Cadillacs are for kids only, here on these big old electric cars, you sometimes have to deal with big old backseat drivers. The auto ride is another Kennywood classic. It first opened in 1930. And Charlie Jackways will tell you that like the Turtle, it was a locally built ride that has endured remarkably well. There used to be a lot of these rides all around. I think this is the only surviving one left in all of the world. At various times during its history, this ride has also been called the auto race, although there's really no race involved. It's more like a rickety-rackety old-fashioned Sunday drive. The cars have changed a little, and so has the track. Back in the old days, when they first opened the auto ride, the auto ride had a series of little hills that you used to go over, but it looks a little like rain. On rainy days, they didn't always get over them. So if you wouldn't quite get over them, then there would be one right in back of you, and then there would be a big accident. So the hills are gone, but the thrills are still enough to keep the ride popular. You might say it's grown old gracefully with all its carefully trimmed hedges. All over Kennywood, there are flowers and trees and carefully tended greenery 
that remind many visitors of earlier days when parks were beautiful as well as thrilling. Kennywood's old-fashioned style and its similarity to the great old parks of Europe are especially pleasing to Kennywood's president, Carl Hughes. Kennywood is a traditional park in what we feel is the finest sense. We feel that Kennywood is America's Tivoli. In Europe, they consider Tivoli as almost the ultimate because it's just like this. It's flowers and charm and rides and people just having fun. And it's also in the city. Carl Hughes remembers Kennywood about the time of the Second World War, when the park gave free tickets to local servicemen. Oh, I came to look for girls. <laughs> like every other guy then. And uh, occasionally was fortunate and occasionally wasn't, but always had fun. When you see Carl around the park, he's a bit conspicuous because of his necktie. And he's famous for always picking up litter. It's a personal fetish as much as anything else. I'm not taking the credit for it. We have a lot of little girls that go around and keep it clean, and they do such a good job, it's very difficult for me to find anything to pick up. The young women with the long-handled dustpans and brooms are known as sweeperettes. They are constantly working to keep the park neat and clean. Other young people at the park are constantly working to keep patrons fat and happy. French fries have become a major attraction at Kennywood. A lot of people come out here and say that they came to the park to eat our fries. They really do. People come back two and three times during the day. Because Bob Sepsik is a student at the University of Pittsburgh. For the summer, he's manager of the Potato Patch, probably the most popular food stand in the park. In 1988, a National Amusement Park trade publication named these French fries the best in America. On an average day, we'll go through around a ton of potatoes. On the busiest days, we'll go through about two and a half tons. It's an old-fashioned operation. We don't have an electric slicer, it's a hand slicer. Nothing fancy about the grease or the fryers. Just put them in, take them out, give them to the people. In another food booth, not far from the potato patch, Amy Winters, a student at Slippery Rock University, puts hot dogs on sticks and transforms them into a Kennywood culinary classic, the corn dog. She makes them, but she doesn't eat them. Well, I tried one when I started here, but that was about it. Amy's worked three summers here at Kennywood and now manages this booth called The Lucky, which has been here since the 1930s. I think you should all make corn dogs because you haven't lived until you made a corn dog. When you eat a lot of fries and corn dogs and such, it's best to wait a while before going on some of the rides. Beth Snodgrass at the Wave Swinger knows all about the consequences. Well, I remember the first day when I came, they said, well, if someone gets sick, you close down the ride, and um, it, it has to be cleaned up. And I thought that the sweep rats came and cleaned it. I didn't know that I had to clean it up. Ride operators have to worry about safety and a thousand other things. Sweetie, you need to tie your tennis shoe, please. On our ride, you have to have your shoes tied. And so Sorry, that's the down. thing for like 15, 16, 17-year-old guys not to have their shoes tied. And you have to say, please tie your shoes. And I mean, they've never tied their shoes since they turned, I guess, a teenager. So they don't like that. Do you want to get off? Yes. yes. I'm calling you chicken all the No, don't call me chicken. Ride operators have to be weathermen, too. They said a storm coming in. And if you said, watch, it's going from here. If you see, you see lightning or anything, you said, bring it down. All right, all right, good. Welcome to the Wave Swinger. Please sit all the way back in your seats, and we're ready to go. Dizzy. I'm so dizzy. My head is spinning. I just watch everything. Make sure kids aren't goofing around and someone's getting hurt. And sometimes you have to yell. Please do not twist your swing. Even on a beautiful hot day, a summer thunderstorm can close things down for a while. It's too dangerous to run most rides when you can see lightning over the thunderbolt. If you're lucky, you can run into Noah's Ark before it closes down, too. Noah's Ark arrived at Kennywood in 1936, the year of the flood, the great St. Patrick's Day flood in Pittsburgh. The Ark has looked essentially the same over the years, but the mountain and the walkways up to the main door have changed several times. 
Charlie Jackways considers this big rocking ride as probably the most recognizable symbol of Kennywood. There used to be about 50 of these around America, and this is the only surviving one. But Father Noah's up there, and he peers out the window. It's interesting that uh, the floor is shimmy and shaking. They have things jump out at you, a snake will jump out at you. But one of the things I like sometimes are the employees, when they step up in back of you and say, keep moving, then you that really gets scary. Who's this, and why is he speaking? Joe Williams from Bloomfield used to be the manager of Noah's Ark. He's 85 and retired now, but he's come back to see how things are going at the park. Everything looks a little different around here, isn't it? This Joe was involved in the extensive remodeling of the Ark in 1969, when they made the entrance through a whale's mouth. Oh, he's an old whale. I used to paint him in the winter time whenever we had to do a little painting. In the same way up there, I painted that ark, and that used to be my job, running that thing. The entrance walkway to the ark used to be rigged with wobbly wooden discs and hidden hoses that would blow air up women's skirts. Oh, everybody's surprised when the air blows the dresses up. I don't know why they shouldn't be. <laughs> Joe says the ark hasn't changed much in 10 years, and those animals at the boat's windows they might be originals, too. But they probably could be, or it could be different. After all, times do change. Changes in the park are part of its charm. Investigating what's new and different about Kennywood is an annual adventure. Picnickers have come to expect at least one or two new rides every summer. And as you learn to love the new ones, you may forget some of the visceral thrills and gut-wrenching charms of rides that somehow disappeared during the winter. Occasionally, you'll find an old favorite like the Satellite, renamed the Super Roundup. And there have always been some rides that some people will never go on. Because the machinery looks dubious, or that's for babies, or maybe you just don't like the idea of spinning around upside down, high in the air above the borough of West Mifflin. For a lark, let's all go down to the amusement park. Hey, 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 hey. come and have fun. There's a boat you can steer and a train you can ride And a trip through the dark with surprises inside <laughs> It's come one, come all Out to the park where the fun all the time for the family This ride called Le Cachot, that's French for dungeon, is what amusement park people call a dark ride. There have been many different dark rides over the years, but Laugh in the Dark may have been the most memorable. It opened in 1930, Kennywood tore it down in 1966 to make way for an expensive Disneyland-like ride called the Turnpike. Its cars now look older than ever. Right next door to the Turnpike is hard-headed Harold's horrendously humorous Haunted Hideaway. Many people still refer to it by its traditional name, the Old Mill. It's the closest Kennywood's ever come to having a tunnel of love, but it's never been called that although it has long been a popular ride for couples seeking romantic amusement. It's perfect for canoodling. Before you get to the end, you know there's really nothing frightening about the haunted hideaway. But the old mill didn't always end so gently. It used to climax with a coaster-like slide down the old mill chute. Now, if you want that kind of thrill, you have to go to the log jam. <laughs> The log jammer is actually more like a wet roller coaster than the old, old mill. The log jammer cost over a million dollars when it was built in 1975. It kept Kennywood competitive in the modern era of the so-called theme parks. You hold on. On a busy day, about 24,000 people will swoosh along its 1,500-foot trough. These young men are here for the St. Athanasius Altar Boys picnic, and they can tell you how to get wet on the log jam. Go down the hill and you lean forward and hit the waves bigger and it splashes more. Getting wet at Kennywood is also an old tradition. It used to be that on a hot summer day, you could take a break from riding and go for a refreshing dip in Kennywood's giant swimming pool. When it first opened in 1925, admission was 50 cents, 
and for a quarter more, you could rent a sterilized bathing suit. It was hailed as one of the largest and most modern swimming pools anywhere. It was 60 yards wide and 120 yards long, with a white sand beach surrounding it on three sides. From the grandstand, you could watch swimmers, sunbathers, and occasionally good-looking competitors in contests like the annual baby pageant or the Miss Pittsburgh selection in 1925. Over the years, bathing suit styles changed, and so did the pool. In the early 1950s, it was converted into a water ride, apparently because of fears about desegregating the pool. In 1956, it reopened for all swimmers. The pool closed at the end of the 1973 season. It was old, it was losing money, and it was losing water. The pool isn't the only park landmark that's gone. The Great Band Shell burned in 1961. It was replaced by the Starview Plaza, but that was torn down along with the Little Dipper Coaster to make room for a get wet ride called the Raging Rapids. The Raging Rapids tries to duplicate the thrills and excitement of whitewater rafting on a wild river. It opened in 1985. The same firm from Switzerland that built the Laser Loop designed this ride. It cost over two and a half million dollars. Welcome to the Raging Rapids. The raft will bump you from side to side, and the white water will get you wet. But you'll have a safe ride. We're on our honeymoon. We're from Welcome Indiana. Welcome to the Raging huh? Rapids. If you're not drenched by the time you reach the last gate, there are two geysers that will soak you. They are controlled by a ride operator who sits in the tower that overlooks this final part of the ride. Lisa Sobeck, a student at Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, coolly pushes the buttons that control the geysers. They come in at a good angle and you really want to get them wet. You can hold down the buttons you know, for as long as you want. If you look like you don't want to get wet, then we hold the button down and keep squirting you as many times as we can to get you really wet. On the Raging Rapids Overlook, John and Lee Sandora from Butler are watching for their kids to float by. He's originally from Dormont, she's from Baldwin, and they have been coming to Kennywood for decades. We came once a year for school. A couple friends and I, we would, we would try to eat. Kennywood was a place to ride roller coasters and eat. And um, my mom's work always had her picnic here, so we'd come with her and spend the whole day. And my mom and dad, they would just sit and they would ride the train and they used to have those silver planes that would go around in a circle. Now we're getting to be there. <laughs> we're looking for the slow rides now. <laughs> you have a good time? On very hot days like this, everyone feels a little bit cooler if Kenny Kangaroo comes by. He's been the Kennywood mascot since 1974, and he's friendly and lovable, but you know whoever's inside that costume must be really hot. Inside Kenny Kangaroo, there's usually a wild and crazy young woman, the kind of girl you'd want on your charades team. Like all good kangaroos, Kenny doesn't talk. So Mitzi Marsh from Munhall, who's inside that costume, has to find nonverbal ways to make people laugh. Sharon Rusak from West Mifflin is Kenny's escort right now. She and Mitzi take turns playing the crazy kangaroo. They've been working together like this for six years. We were real young at the time. We just both of us graduated from high school. So we've kind of grown up in the costume together. You know, it sounds really corny, but we really have. Sharon knows what she likes about the job. I just get a thrill when I see the kids, and I like to make people laugh. And I think that's the best part. Kenny has his own little dressing room down under, down under the island stage. It's a special place where every year the people who play Kenny and some of his big-headed friends all leave a painted message. The women who play Kenny do a lot of people watching at the park, and they pay special attention to the way people dress. Every summer it's like a different ad or something. This summer is that spandex. That's kind of scary, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> It's really scary. One summer was the Madonna look. You know, the way people are dressed, sometimes that causes you to act a certain way toward them or just interact with the people. That's about the best way I can describe it. These Kennys also know about local slang. And all true Pittsburghers know that Kennywood Park's open means your zipper is down. 
I went to Clary to, um, for, you know, college, and occasionally I did see someone with their zipper down, you know, and I said, <laughs> Kennywood's open, and they had no idea what I was talking about. You know, people that came from Erie or something, but, you know, a few people did know, so it's like kind of a universal thing, you know, Kennywood's <laughs> open, your flies. So. <laughs> with so many kids in the park, it's inevitable that a few will get lost. Do you know what your name is? What's your name? When people or things get lost at Kennywood, they often end up at the service center building where Naomi Jones runs the lost and found. Naomi keeps careful records of all that is lost, found, and returned. She has boxes of unclaimed items, jewelry, baseball caps, eyeglasses. And these are keys. I don't know how they get back home because they're car keys and house keys. Do you have any information on that red purse? No, we don't, honey. Uh, the red purse, was that your grandma's? Naomi has been working at the park longer than anyone else. She started when she was in high school in 1929. Well, when I first started here, this was a mud hole. It wasn't paved, it was the dirt, you know, and when it rained, everybody was mud from head to feet. There was no such thing as slacks and shorts. And of course, way back then, it was the long skirts, you know. No minis like we have today. But uh, times change. Everything changes. Naomi, she's on the right, was working here when Kennywood staged its first gala parade and costume day at the end of the 1929 season. This is the Charleston costumes, very risque. <laughs> at that time. Naomi enjoys working with a lot of young people at the park. And they do keep you thinking young and acting young. And I've learned a lot of things from these kids that I never knew in all my years. Actually, age has never been a big factor at Kennywood. Height is the criterion for being able to ride certain rides. Yeah. And until you're as tall as Kenny or Henry or whichever character you remember, it may seem unfair. Throughout Kennywood's history, music has been a big attraction. From the earliest days until 1953, there was dancing in the dance hall at Kennywood. It was most crucial to the park during the 1930s, when appearances by popular big bands helped the park survive hard times. Since 1978, the park has hired talented young performers every year to do daily shows at the Garden Theater. This band called Razzmatazz specializes in Dixieland jazz and a variety of popular songs. Arthur Turner plays keyboards for Razzmatazz. He's a graduate of Carnegie Mellon, studying now at the New England Conservatory in Boston. Personally, I'm kind of tired of doing these shows, but you never get tired when the audience is there, they're up, they're fresh, it's their first time. So then they get the excitement that you felt during rehearsal. And when you see that in their face, then you remember why the show was so good. Arthur's fellow musicians have nicknamed him Beethoven for lots of reasons. In between Razzmatazz shows, he goes over to the park's old calliope and plays old standards that fit an old-fashioned amusement park. One way to keep the continuity going in this park is to have some kind of musical background. There's music in the calliope and there's music in the shows. There are, there's music all over the place. People still come to the park for all kinds of picnics. Kennywood has always had picnic tables. You can see some of the picnic groves when you ride on the train which has had many different names since 1945, when the engines came to Pittsburgh. The trains had been built originally for the Gimbel's department store and used at the New York World's Fair in 1939. They've always offered a chance to see some of the Mon River below, parts of Kitty Land, and the picnic pavilions. School picnics are held at the beginning of the season. After the 4th of July, Different companies and local communities hold picnics complete with wacky games and races. For over 75 years, there was a Scotch Nationality Day at Kennywood, and other nationalities continue that tradition today. 
often the biggest day of the entire summer, is Italian Day. A nationality day gives people a chance to celebrate their ethnic origins, to have a wild time, and a picnic. They started dating three years ago today. They got engaged today. And they're going to have an Italian wedding and an Italian family and an Italian life. There's lots of music and picnic tables full of food. Jerry Borelli says his family's been coming here as long as there's been Italian Day. But well, we've kind of re-instituted the tradition the past 10 years where it's kind of like a family reunion. Family and our, even our non-Italian friends now come here and everybody's Italian today. We cook all day fresh. We make the tortellini and the hot sausage and the meatballs and you name it, it comes out and we just have a good time. The Italian Sons and Daughters of America used to bring orphans from St. Anthony's out here. Now they share pizza and good times with hundreds of less fortunate kids from all over the city. The first Italian day at Kennywood was in 1935. Now all these Italian Pittsburghers are full of memories. Then when them days when you went for a ride, your mother kept all the tickets. And every ride should give you two for the two ride, tickets. and you'd run all the way up into there where the ride was and come all, all the way, way back, back with these shelters <laughs> were to get your other two tickets for the next ride. That's By the right. time the night was over, you was pretty darn tired. Please don't, don't mention how many years. About 30, 25. About 25 years we're married, about, really, about 30 years. I met him at Kennywood Dance before it burned down. We would have these big bushels filled with goodies, including wine, homemade wine, covered. Nobody touched it. No one touched it. You could leave everything on the table. There was no problem. In those days, you didn't have that much money, so you'd go around to the different groves and see where people had picnic baskets and grab a sandwich and so on. And that way, you could stay the rest of the day and wait for the dance to come on. I remember clearly as a teenager, when it started to get dark, we would go in the back of the pavilion and neck. <laughs> Many people punctuate their memories of Kennywood with laughter. The park has always been a place for innocent wickedness, a place where centrifugal force often squashes bodies together. And eventually you get to that age when you don't want to hang out with your brother or sister, and certainly not with your parents. At Kennywood, many teenagers become more sophisticated. And at the same time, many adults feel wild and childish again. It's a good place to get all shaken up, bounced and turned around. Kennywood is also a great place just to walk around. It's fun getting from one ride to the next. What probably brings most out-of-towners to the park, however, are the coasters. And the racer is especially interesting because it's the last racing coaster in America that has a single track. There are two trains that race, but they run on a cleverly designed track that's actually one long loop. And if you start in the train on the left, you'll end up on the right and vice versa. Charlie Jackways never rode on a coaster till he was 35 years old, but now he loves them, especially the racer, which is probably the mildest coaster at Kennywood. This is the one when you sort of graduate to an adult roller coaster, you ride the racer. This will take your breath away, but once you get used to it, you're ready for the Jackrabbit. Like the Jackrabbit, the racer was designed and built by John Miller, one of the masters of the golden age of American roller coasters. This was the last coaster he ever designed and coaster enthusiasts will travel far just to experience its unique charm. The loading platform building has had several different designs over the years. Going over this part, the blue one with the red one's almost stopped. I have a feeling the red one's gonna be the winner before this ride is so. Got your money down. The red one is the winner. And they're enjoying it. People who enjoy coasters seem to thrive on fear and the feeling of danger. Psychologists have studied coaster lovers and have found that being scared makes some people feel very much alive. Henny Henninger likes occasionally to grab a quick ride on the laser loop. 
<laughs> Anytime I need a pick-me-up, a good shot on the laser loop will get that heart beating again, put the smile back on your face, and make you realize why you're here. The laser loop is an example of modern coaster technology. It's what insiders call a shuttle loop coaster. The train accelerates to 54 miles per hour in 3.8 seconds, powered by a catapult mechanism similar to the system that propels jets off aircraft carriers. Centrifugal force pushes you into the seat the whole way through the loop, thanks to a law of physics called the conservation of angular momentum. There's a brief instant of weightlessness at each end of the track. The ride on a steel coaster is engineered with computer precision. You get none of the clinking, the shaking, the bone-crunching jerks, quirks, uncertainties, and wonderful surprises that you find on a classic coaster like the Thunderbolt. Widely acknowledged as a masterpiece of the art of amusement, the Thunderbolt is the offspring of an older coaster called the Pippin. Master builder John A. Miller designed the Pippin in 1924. In the winter of 1967, Andy Vettel, then the park's master mechanic, redesigned the Pippin. His Thunderbolt debuted in 1968. Andy Vettel Jr., his father designed the Thunderbolt, teaches at Steel Valley High School. During the summer, he's the voice of Kennywood. The park is truly his home. Growing up, he lived with his family in a house on the park grounds. He remembers the old Pippin. It used to basically go from where you see turning into the station, it was a straight shot, came right down here. So right now, I would say I'm standing on at where the loading station was for the old Pippin. Andy also remembers some early changes in the Thunderbolt itself. My dad changed the track after, I think, the first year. You come off the incline, come down, you go around once and come around. There was a bump out there, a speed bump he had put in. But I think they decided that that was a little too rough for the average rider. The Thunderbolt's national reputation was established in June of 1974, when Robert Cartmell, an art professor from upstate New York, wrote an article for the New York Times about American roller coasters. He named the Thunderbolt as the ultimate, the king of the coasters. Lots of other writers and riders agree. In his book, Charlie Jackways calls the Thunderbolt the heart of Kennywood. But he goes on to say that the merry-go-round is its soul. This is by far is my favorite ride of all. It's the Grand Carousel. It was built in 1926. It's four rows. It's 72 animals. It's one of the truly great ones in America. There were two earlier carousels at Kennywood, but this one revolves in the memories of most Pittsburghers. Its music comes from a 1916 Wurlitzer band organ. A lot of people always look for Tony Sacramento at the merry-go-round. He's worked at Kennywood since the mid-1930s, and he's famous for his smooth, friendly style and his years of tending to the carousel and its riders. After the sun sets, the park begins a gradual transformation. Lights start to come on. Back at the turn of the century, Kennywood was one of the first places in the Pittsburgh area to have electric lights. They still add a kind of magic. At 9 o'clock, there's always a show on the stage in the middle of the lagoon. These shows are an old tradition.
As the voice of Kennywood, Andy Vettel is also the master of ceremonies for these shows today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys. Kennywood takes the greatest of pleasure in presenting its evening Lagoon stage show. Tonight's show features a Hollywood stuntman who climbs into a paper coffin of death and blows it up with explosives. Andy leads the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, fire! The stuntman is stunned, but survives. He'll be back for the 4.30 show tomorrow afternoon. In the meantime now, all the many games, rides, refreshments, and amusements are waiting for you right now. To help you around that journey of fun and enjoyment right here. The one and only roller coaster capital of the world. Thank you. Round love, roller coaster. There are skill games all over the park. Places to throw balls, shoot guns, knock things down, and win all kinds of prizes. And there it is, table number 17. 17 lights from across the bottom. Big guy, love you, Bear. <laughs> Families establish their own game traditions, and people perfect their skills by coming here a long time. Longer than I care to tell you, <laughs> about 30 years, and we're from Texas and came in last night to come today. We're from Plum Borough. We brought Cow, he's seven weeks old. He rode on the merry-go-round tonight. We're here because he wanted him to get a good look around at everything, because he'll be coming for a while. <laughs> Even if you're usually in bed by this time, exceptions are often made on a Kennywood day. Kittyland stays open and busy until the park closes. Over the years, the Penny Arcade has seen a lot of change. The building's filled now with video games and high-tech razzle-dazzle. You can win some silly prizes. If you look around carefully, you'll find some older machines. Reminders of what the arcade used to be like, when you would stuff your pockets with photo cards of baseball players, movie stars, pop singers, and even your own future. Kennywood has had a penny arcade since its very early days. Back in one corner, a few penny machines still work. Rob Mahalchik from Portview takes care of these machines. Occasionally, he also works in the arcade's basement, where antiques are stored. Rob tinkers every now and then with these old hand crank movie viewers called mutoscopes. The reason why they're not upstairs in the Penny Arcade is well because there's a lot of brass parts on the inside and the brass starts to wear and they just can't get the parts anymore because they are so old. The flip card movies are on dusty old reels. They've got cartoons, westerns, exotic dancers. And we've got studio wrestling. And this is a favorite of my grandmother's. She loved studio wrestling. If you've got a date, the park can be especially lovable. If you're not attached, well, those St. Athanasius altar boys, you know what they're here to do. Chase after girls. It's about basically what we do here. <laughs> yeah, what's your name? My name's Jenny. What's your name? Chad. That's Jenny. Oh, That's gee, Jenny. hi. Yeah, let's go. Start the ride. Just for a three. You make my life one 
And then when I got older, we would come out when we were like 16 and 17 and we would hang out at Kennywood. <laughs> and we would, yeah, watch guys. Even if it's not true, the coasters seem to roll faster at night. And memories are bright and colorful. But going home in the evening, we would wait till the very last minute to get the train. Of course, you have, you know, all of your things that you've won or a boy has won for you. And you'd run down over here, but I can remember carrying goldfish. We always won goldfish. And my mother and my father would say, please do not win any goldfish. You can't win goldfish at Kennywood anymore. But when the night gets late and you're ready to go home, you can always stop at the fish pond, where everyone is sure to get a souvenir. This is hers. Uh -huh. In 1987, the U.S. Department of the Interior officially recognized all of Kennywood Park as a National Historic Landmark. It's an unusual honor for an amusement park, but it acknowledges just how special this place is. How great it is that this trolley park has survived. And as Charlie Jackways will tell you, what an unforgettable place it is for all the people who know and love it. All those happy, happy memories. It's more than one generation, it's multiple. It's my dad and mother. When I was three years old, first brought me out. So it, it's that combination of something that from your childhood, as well as when you get to be an adult. And it's fun sometimes seeing the senior citizens come, just sit on the bench and enjoy watching the young people run full tilt, running to their favorite ride. It's hard to pinpoint what makes Kennywood so special. It's an honest old trolley park that's always changing, yet always keeping pieces of its past. It seems new and freshly painted, even though it's old. While other parks try to appear traditional and all-American, Kennywood is genuine. And since 1899, it's been a place where people hate to see the summer night come to an end. When they announce the park will close in 15 minutes and the lights start to go out, you have to leave. But you know, this is a place you will remember. For information on obtaining other videos in the Pittsburgh Home Video Collection, please call Collect, 412-622-1307, or write to QED Enterprises, 4802 Fifth Avenue, Pittsburgh, PA, 15213.